Um, uh, I have uh, one first question because I'm curious, like uh, this uh, spinning uh, film that you showed at the beginning, uh, were, were the films made specifically for the, the format or were there any that were made for like more classical film reels that were like then made uh, in this format? So the, um, of course the role of technologies is, um, so w which is often called the, the material, materialities of media culture is a very important aspect in many cases. And uh, just mentioning that in this whole tradition, if we, if we think about the sort of like a kind of a, like I say, cultural series of the data disk, um, a serious um, issue in the early stages was that it was extremely difficult to come up with um, uh, cameras that would record these things directly um, on, um, in spiral form on, uh, on uh, disks. So in most cases, uh, what you have are disks that have undergone some kind of a transfer process. So in many cases, pictures transferred from traditional film to a disk format. So, so rather than being a sort of like a shot with a device on a, on a sort of like a, like a record or disk based negative and then turned into a positive. So this is a, it's a specific question, but I mean that this is just a specific answer too. So because media culture does have certain kind of issues and um, I could, it's, you can, if anyone is interested, you can read the very long story from my new book, uh, Magical Devices, when it's going to be published next year at MIT Press. So one um, chapter traces this history of the, of the archaeology of the data disk, and, uh, and I talk about this topic at length in that, uh, that chapter. But there are interesting sort of like problems that seem to, sometimes seem to be almost impossible to overcome in terms of technical conditions for, for the certain kind of media context, uh, context to develop. It's not the only reason, but it's one reason. Um, is there any question from the audience? Here. What about the floppies? <laughs> floppies, uh, yes, I, I only mentioned the word floppy yeah, in that. Floppy. Yeah, yeah. Well, well, but I mean that I, I think that the, it is um, it is certainly an interesting interesting element of of this 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 history and uh, as we know, floppy was uh, adopted by artists too. I actually uh, had several examples that I took away in the interest of time. So so there is a definitely a, a link and connection between those 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 media too and. Uh, not everything is, is uh, obviously part of the disc-based cultural series. Sometimes the discs are spinning in a hidden place. And, um, and uh, so media culture, so one of the recurring topics of media culture is this sort of like um, uh, dynamics between uh, sort of like um, hidden and revealed hardware or hidden and revealed technology. So, uh, so sometimes thing, things are happening as if in an engine room behind walls. Sometimes they are happening in situations we are up where we are watching the, the sort of like the media machinery operate. And I think that the especially not, not so much about flop, talking about floppies itself, but I mean that the computer hard disk is an interesting example because it is basically a disk based uh, mechanical format. But but that 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 operation of the spinning disk is um, is hidden. In a way, you could say that the same happens for the CD-ROM when the CD-ROM disk is placed inside a computer and and it starts 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 spinning it. So so the the disk uh, disappears to be to be played back. So this idea about the disappearance of the medium and its reappearance when you push a <laughs> push a button and the thing comes out from the machine is, is part of this certain kind of a, a choreography of media materiality that I think we also have to take into account. Any other questions? Um, well, um, 
hearing what you, Erkis, uh, lecture, uh, that's true, for instance, about CD-ROM as any other media technology, that it's not just capturing uh, the content, but it's capturing the whole context, that is the experience of the user, the culture at that time around that media, the magazine, and so on, and the packaging. Uh, yes, it is. And that's what we tried to do for this uh, welcome to the exhibition, because we decided to present it on a vintage computer, so that people had the experience of what it is to be in front of a computer in the uh, 90s, which is very different now with a laptop or uh, an iPad, um, and also to have all the original packaging. What we also tried to do it's to uh, um, record, like you showed some of them, uh, navigation sessions uh, into, so into the CD-ROMs, that is with some uh, screen saver uh, in video. And uh, indeed, you can find a lot on YouTube. And that's, these are very interesting documentation. What would be also interesting is to record uh, the experience of user uh, of that time, who used to play with uh, uh, the CD-ROM, and of course to interview all the artists, uh, the producers, the developers at that time. And so that's why I'm thinking um, with the recall tool uh, that you, you developed, uh, um, well, uh, indeed it's a kind of system where you can, uh, uh, it's a database where you can uh, put a lot of media, uh, text, video, uh, pictures, uh, and then annotate them. Uh, and maybe it could be also useful to describe, uh, for instance, the, this kind of objects, complex object with the relationship of users. Uh, uh, in the same way, you could maybe use it also for installation and so on. Uh, but it's clear that capturing um, all the information around this object is, is very important. Uh, I think that, so we are, we are I totally ag agree with you about this, and, it, it's, uh, and I, I knew that you already took steps to that direction in your exhibition, which is, which is great. Um, so obviously, um, we deal with an interesting problem, which is that uh, this, uh, so we say that this, this major w wave of, as I mentioned, the CD-ROMs took place exactly when the web was just appearing. But web was not developed uh, well enough so that it would have uh, provided a platform, let's say, for a lot of chatter about certain titles, like, like uh, let's say, uh, social media these days can provide for people to exchange information about things and pass on tips to others and that kind of things. So this, um, to the extent that we, that we think that this kind of like uh, what's often known as the user's share, so the, the, the record of the uh, experience of people using these devices, I, I have a feeling that it's very poorly represented about the CD-ROM culture because there was no uh, natural uh, medium where that sort of like exchange of information could, could have happened. Um, I, I could imagine that there would have been a lot of frustration um, expressed, you know, about the fact how difficult it some, sometimes was to get certain uh, like uh, discs to play. I certainly had some really kind of like a big fits, you know, I remember when I had to uh, uh, review something like maybe 50 or 60 discs for this jury <laughs> jury process. They sent me big cardboard boxes full of CD-ROMs. And, and I, I remember that I first selected everything that's for the Macintosh because it was easy to, I could be sure that probably they will play with my, I had this uh, pretty nice Quadra, a Macintosh Quadra AV, which um, did play them. But when it when it was, I had a PC, and then I had CDI uh, from Philips too, and uh, when it came to PC, I, I I had a lot of frustrating sessions trying to figure out how in the world can I play make the CD from play, and uh, and I do imagine that many people had to sort of like express similar frustration, but there must have been also the opposite side because there was fascination. But I think that maybe one way how th this could be done, which is not the same, would be to start some kind of web uh, websites where people could actually post 
the memories and experiences of these CD, CD-ROMs, just like we have, a, um, for example, uh, there's an interesting website called I Used to Believe, in which, which people are posting uh, uh, memories of all kinds of crazy things that they used to believe, mostly when they were kids and, and uh, sort of like ad- adolescents including beliefs in people, uh, little people living inside ra- radio and television sets and that kind of things. So maybe that kind of a website might inspire some people who still have strong memories of actually trying to use those CD-ROMs at the time. Yeah, just a comment like when we prepared the exhibition, uh, um, there was this... Uh, um, uh, CD-ROM made with Brian Eno uh, music and uh, some uh, specific glasses uh, for you to look at the, the graphical uh, stuff that was happening. And I think this kind of, uh, um, by researching a little bit more on the on the CD-ROM, uh, um, the history is that Brian Eno really hated uh, uh, the result and really said that it was, uh, there was one thing that he regretted that he had done in his career and it was like collaborating with these people to make the CD-ROM. And uh, a little bit like uh, how you showed that stuff pop up again at some point, like uh, on YouTube. Uh, this uh, capture of this uh, CD-ROM like popped up on on YouTube, and and the discussion started in the comments on, in the, in the in the YouTube section on 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 the history of that. There's also always some some fascination, at least for some people, to make oneself uh, ridiculed by an audience, and I sometimes enjoy that. You know, like. Um, um, Peter Gabriel made two well-known CD-ROMs called uh, Explorer 1 and, and Eve. And I, I did kind of enjoy the Explorer 1, but uh, I never got uh, past the opening scenes in Eve. I just simply couldn't figure out how I could get to the next level. So up to this day, I'm hoping that somebody posts a certain kind of like a playthrough on, 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 on YouTube that I would be able to see what was supposed to be seen. I, I tried quite a long time and I couldn't figure out as an okay. I, I, but it was a nice package so I left it in my shelf and I still have it but I never made any, any headway through it. So, uh, can you hear me? So, uh, you mentioned, of course, that the CD-ROM was frustrating for the artists because it turned out to be a bit limiting. One, one example, uh, you may, Art Spiegelman did this mouse thing, which was really a very nice, actually it's very nice. It's a, a kind of a, a retrospective of how he came to make this graphic yes. novel about his father's uh, experience in Auschwitz. But at one point he mentions how he came to make it and how he had imagined that he could include uh, all his uh, drawings and uh, recordings of his father and so forth, and then he, he quickly realized how limiting it was and sort of had to pare back his ambitions. But for me, that's one of the highlights of, uh, of CD-ROMs. I, I, I never really was a CD-ROM person, but I, I like the things where really well-known people experimented with the medium, and then in this case, he expresses in that his, his disappointment. I think that the... Um yeah, this is a very important point. Actually, I, I liked very much the uh, mouse as well. I think it was a great Voyager title. And I think that the one of the important things we can probably uh, get from this sort of like field of retro retro gaming, so the uh, looking at those very, very early um, 8-bit games and that kind of thing is the fact, is just the kind of the reminder that sometimes limitations are useful. Sometimes limitations can produce great work. It is not always like this endless amount of data that produces the magnificent stuff. Sometimes the fact that you have to sort of like squeeze uh, your ideas into a sort of like within certain kind of uh, framework can actually help for your your creativity. And uh, and I, I think that certainly there are some such works that. Um, you know, utilize this possibility as far as I remember, let's say the uh, great uh, piece uh, called uh, sc- sc- Scrutiny or Scrutiny on the, on, the, on the great round, this Jim Gasparini, Tennessee Rice, Dixon and Charlie Morrow, used relatively limited amount of space, but 
produced a wonderful piece that I think took the most out of that, that relatively limited uh, sort of like like uh, possibilities within which it worked. And I think that from many uh, digital forms and di digital arts, we could find this kind of cases. We find uh, early virtual reality installations. Uh, for example, uh, the piece uh, called Menagerie by Scott, uh, Scott Fisher, Susan Amco, and Sha um, M M Miguel Giron, uh, whatever his name was, which used just wireframe graphics because there was no other possibility to sort of like uh, to make it react in pretty close to real time. And the fact that you see these amazing wireframe animals jumping at you and jumping over you is much more interesting for me than having sort of like very, very standard rendered animals with some kind of leopard skin, you know. So that fact that it had this kind of wireframe quality uh, in that case was a necessity, but it aesthetically worked on that piece. I guess that there would be many other examples. Could each of the other four panelists say one thought that they wish for this audience to know about? Could you repeat? I don't understand. <laughs> sure. Could you've, we've, I'm fascinated by CD-ROMs, but nothing's worse than having four people listen to other people talk about CD-ROMs when you've had your presentations. Is there something you wanted the audience to know while you were sitting up here that you, that you want them to know? A thought, an idea, a statement. Well, for our experience, it's uh, only uh, the evolution of uh, practices who uh, teach us how to, uh, to show uh, these artworks. It was uh, something we understand uh, not so, so far. So it was very, it's, yes, it's uh, very interesting. Ladies, come on. Oh, it's only men who's speaking. I have a question for a lady. Um, <laughs> so. I really have a question. Uh, um, like the recall software, uh, I think it's great that it's open source. And uh, I was wondering if the idea was to um, uh, also that, uh, to make it open source so that, for instance, a collection that has a performance artwork with uh, uh, um, uh, technology embedded in the in the show or in the performance uh, uh, would be able to connect like the recall software to their collection management system and in this case if that's the idea that a museum that already has a system to catalog or to describe or document a work um, when you build the software did you uh, try to use uh, uh, standards uh, for uh, description or metadata that are already used in some collection, or is there any? Did you think of any way where it would it would be uh, easy to like connect other database collection management system uh, to your tool? Okay, so um, the the choice of the open source is uh, very important because if you want to do preservation, one of the standard says that uh, you have to do op you have to to be open source. So uh, there was no reason to not be open source in this context. So that's the first point. The second is that uh, interoperability is very important. And uh, so we, we are uh, actually implementing Dublin Core to, for the description uh, of the, the notice. Um, so if you have um, documentation with Dublin Core, you can import all uh, the notice in recall and uh, to work with this metadata. And then recall, uh, the only thing it, it does is to, to creating an XML file. So with the XML document, the XML language, let's say, um, you can uh, 
um, then export uh, this XML file in uh, another program dealing with XML. That's it. I have a question for Chulin and uh, Celine, so you don't get off the hook. Um, so you sh it's very interesting to have a preservation project based on artificial life. I don't actually know any other projects like that. Um, but when you're preserving, for example, the films that you showed, whose animations are built from genetic algorithms, is it more important to preserve the movie or the genetic algorithms themselves? Excuse me. <coughs> um, oui. Les œuvres uh, qui sont uh, de la vie artificielle ou de l'intelligence artificielle, justement, les œuvres là, c'est juste parmi tous les systèmes, juste comme une goutte d'eau, juste une petite trace. Et pour nous, ce qui est important, c'est tout le concept dans ce système. They were uh, uh, programmed and 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 played back or uh, like used. Ah, for the the material, to say the sauvegarde. Um, but it's difficult. Ah, uh, as now the author is still there. Often the author, artist, he rewrites. Le propre programme dans un nouveau système. Je veux dire, dans le système, par exemple, informatique. Euh, là, on n'est pas encore dans la. Euh, on n'a pas encore fait la émulation, mais c'est plutôt l'auteur à écrire. Écrire le système pour adapter le nouveau système. Mais est-ce que, est que le, les, les disquettes ou l'ordinateur original pour lequel. Elles ont été faites. Existe Est-ce que c'est quelque chose que vous avez euh, dans votre euh, ou que les auteurs ont euh... Bah, euh, Souvent, c'est euh, filmé comme le vidéo, juste une vidéo documentaire. Et euh, après, tous les programmes, tous les ordinateurs sont <rire> sont plus là. Oui. Okay, so they they don't exist anymore and they don't have access to it. So that's why, like, video is the only thing they can preserve. Oui. Uh, et alors pour nous, finalement, comme en même temps on est une formation, il y a la transmission, le savoir-faire. Alors du coup, pour nous, ce qui est important, euh, comme aujourd'hui j'ai beaucoup euh, aussi euh, entendu, appris sur la archéologie des, des, des miti, euh, médias, mais pour nous, c'est plutôt dans l'archive de poésis, c'est-à-dire le processus de création, et aussi dans les processus de réception. C'est vraiment dans cette partie de l'expérience humaine. So, like in their um, their educational goal in this in this program department is 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 not really to focus on the archaeology of the media, but more on the archaeology of the creative process and the reception uh, of the works uh, of these works. So, so these issues with the interactive installations uh, can be really very complicated. I, I think I, th I think we all know so. And uh, I already encountered this problem in um, actually uh, 20 years ago, 1994. Uh, I organized um, <coughs> the um, sort of like the first uh, big exhibitions of uh, the Japanese artist Toshio Iwai in Europe. So. 
this exhibition was shown at the uh, temporary space of ZKM before ZKM was opened in the in the munition factory, and at the Dutch Design Institute in Amsterdam, and and in in Helsinki in Finland in a gallery, and um, Toshio started working in the 80s uh, uh, using uh, the Japanese computers of the time, the FM towns and that kind of uh, Toshiba machines and things like that, and. Uh, and so, so we, we had to come to the conclusion already in 1994 that the only way we can uh, show Toshio's interactive installations made so like between in the past 10 years was to basically to ship all those original computers from Japan for the big show. So we found a good deal with Air India. It was the cheapest one. So we had a huge amount of those FM Towns computers and those shipped to Europe. And then they were afterwards shipped back to Japan. So, and, and they kind of worked, but I mean, they needed quite a lot of work already then to be able to show those things that were only 10 years old, in some cases, sometimes five years old. Um, so Toshio, uh, as I hear from him, so still keeps those machines in case there's going to be some big retrospective of his uh, amazing work in the future. But then again, so it's anybody's guess, you know, uh, how uh, late 1980s, also Amigas, uh, Amiga computers, and, uh, and um, FM Towns, how those machines that are in a storage outside Tokyo will, will run anymore, because uh, there are no emulators, as I, as I understand, except for maybe just a few things that were shown at the ICC after, afterwards. So these really are very, very complicated issues. I personally uh, would prefer showing them on those original computers, because for me at least, the original hardware and software uh, is an integral part of that, that work. So as you can hear, I'm not the so-called emulator guy. I only accept em emulator when it is the necessity, when there is no other way of experiencing all the works. I think the preference, and this is, you can debate me, you know, but I think the preference is that always, if possible, to to p play everything with the original hardware, original software. Only when that does not work, it's absolutely impossible, then play an emulator version. Does someone want to debate that? Your reaction, Erki, to the, um, uh, what is it, the gadget for iPhone then, which you showed, which seemed pretty um, meager to me um, from the view that you showed on the screen, and yet there are examples of works of net art and installation art by Scott Snibby and Leah and Hervé Grauman, I think, that mm. Morgan knows more about than I do, where people seem to have very successfully crossed the boundary from sort of fragile 90s-based interactive works to um, rather popular, um, you know, iPad and 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 um, and sort of app-based projects. Well, I I don't want to take a hard line uh, stance, you know, in these things. You know, I I, I have to I, I I do admit the fact that it's case by case. You know, that some some works probably do, do translate much more beautifully and interestingly than others and. Uh, and I guess, but then, then there's this big question whether we do think it as a kind of a version 2.0 or whether we pretend that that is the original, which it, which it isn't. I don't think that gadget on an on a iPad is, uh, in, in a certain strict sense, is no longer the, the same gadget, even though it may be using the, even some of the same software. I don't know how that conversion has been done, actually. So I'm, I've lost contact with Shono. I, I don't even know if Shono himself did that, actually. Probably he did, but I mean that, uh, that I, I don't know. So uh, in that case, uh, I don't know. I'm kind of pleased because uh, it had a certain kind of special quality in its time, and, and I haven't been able to play it on an iPad myself, you know, this, this thing. So... So I don't know the specifics of that. But in that case, I would say that there's very little chance that more than a, in maybe some exhibition context, people might get in touch, you know, 
get to play that quite remarkable thing. But I mean that, yeah, I would. I don't want to be a hardliner. You know, it doesn't make sense. So in that sense, I I guess that if it translates beautifully and and fine uh, to that medium, so why not do that? But but let's not pretend that it's exactly the same as it. Is, it is a certain kind of a transfiguration or, or displacement somehow of that 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 early work. And just to follow up, I I think that's um, that makes sense to do a case by case, and it connects a little bit to what Chu Yin was saying about algorithms and the whole project. Um, in the case of the, the pieces I'm thinking that I feel most successful often derived from an algorithm where it didn't really matter whether the precise code was ported because it was the, the function of the code that mattered more. And in the case of Scott Snibby, you know, he created a project like Gar Gravelux that maybe, maybe a couple hundred, maybe a thousand people, although I don't think that many saw in a gallery that required you know, tens of thousands of dollars to complete. And after porting it to the iPad, he woke up one morning and he was the single highest download under entertainment in free apps. And he estimated that 500,000 people have his project now on their iPad. There are some, what's interesting in this um, um, transformation or new version of work, for instance, uh, there is another example, uh, the, the Small Fish CD-ROM by uh, Fujiata and Al, which was uh, published by ZKM, has been ported to also iPad. Uh, and many digital natives just download that, use it, and they don't know where it comes from. And then they are very surprised. Oh, yes, it was made 20 years ago. Uh, uh, so it's interesting to, to convey this history and this new life. Uh, of course, it's a different experience. It's a completely different experience. But at least there is something. Uh, 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 but then the question is, uh, for instance, for all these uh, Ported work uh, or new works like Scott Snip work or the works that she, he did for uh, uh, Bjork on uh, iPhone and ab iPad, it says they are going to be obsolete uh, also very soon. And, and uh, how we are going, and there are many uh, interesting artworks on uh, 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 smartphone and tablets, uh, and how we are going to preserve that is also being a big problem and is going to arrive very fast. These are all, all very important things, and of, of course, it's important to make these experiences av available for a, like a con totally new uh, generation of people who may have been born after they, they were actually made, so we are in that kind of situation. So the issue is that, I mean, that, that obviously there are many uh, very, very special, delicate issues in this uh, transformation from one uh, media platform to another, and... Uh, Let's say one one has to do with this sort of like the idea about latency and the fact that you know that some of these early things were could be quite slow in speed just because because of the you know the calculating speed of the computer and things like that. So and and I think that there is a certain kind of tendency very easily to see in a way speed them up, uh, make them more smooth and and fast because we can do it so easily with this new. Uh, uh, the new available hardware, that kind of thing. And, um, and so the important thing is that in many cases in those earlier versions, that certain kind of slowness and a little bit kind of s sloppy you know, motion is an aesthetic feature of those pieces. There was an interesting example about this when, uh, so uh, Krista Sommer and Laura Mignonot, the, the great interactive um, uh, artists, when they, uh, uh, so they made their early artificial life installations using silicon graphics computers. So uh, iris indigo, that kind of things. And, uh, and then, of course, these things became obsolete when the PCs started getting more powerful. And that installation, which was made 1992, was then, uh, in a way, transported to the PC environment by Laura Mignonot. And in the first version, so when they did that conversion, so what happened is that you know that that um, speech is about building uh, interactive uh, digital gardens with your touching actual plants. It became speeded up a lot, so he wasn't able to control that speed. So which means I touched these plants and, and these trees grew instantaneously, and uh, and I told Lauren, Lauren, this is a mistake. 
uh, I said, well, this does not work anymore. I don't recognize your work. So he slowed it down. And, and so e even though that the new computer that he uses has much more power than those former supercomputers, graphics supercomputers by Silicon Graphics, he had to artificially slow it down to get down, get that, that experience, which was beautiful, beautifully related with the pretty slow and kind of a painful growth, hard growth of those digital plants on the screen. And I think that for me, this is a very important issue. How do you, how do you sort of like keep the sort of like the, the earlier quality, even though when you, when you sort of like then upgrade these things to a much more powerful sort of like digital environment? Yes. Um. Just uh, some words about uh, your question um, about uh, the portage of the, um, from the CD-ROM to iPad. Uh, yes, it's like, um, it's like a, a reincarnation. So it's uh, um, a la fois the same and other things. It's a new experience, okay? It's not, it's not Conservation is not preservation. It's like uh, heritage, but in in French sense, you know, c'est une tradition, a repropriation. That, that's why uh, I'm thinking that uh, you you have to document not only the technological aspects of the work, but the artistic intentions. Um, uh, I, I was saying that uh, you, that's why I think that you don't have only to document the technological aspects uh, of the work, but the artistic intentions. Uh, when, you, uh, when, when you were describing the, the movement of, uh, of the hand and uh, how the plants are growing and so on, this is artistic intentions. Mm. This is not the code. Mm. So that, that's why uh, I, I try to, to design recall to document the artistic intentions. Mm. And you can also have uh, the first technical documentation, but then you can adapt the, technolo the technology to um, the evolution of the computers, of the calculators, and so on. And um, I think if we think about um, adaptation of the works, technological adaptations. It's about uh, how can you do the same aesthetic experience nowadays of the works you've seen 20 years ago. And I think that's one of the points which is very difficult with digital art. Et justement, pour continuer dans cette direction, je pense qu'une des choses qui nous manque le plus dans la culture du CD-ROM, c'est une histoire critique. One, one thing that we miss is in the history of uh, CD-ROM is uh, a critical approach or yeah. thinking of it. Il y a très peu de littérature en réalité. On a souvent des, des cours comptes rendus qui sont juste des notices très brèves. There's euh, no literature. Uh, the only thing that, that is available is like very short uh, uh, notice or a text about the, uh, the titles. Il n'y a pas vraiment eu de controverse, il n'y a pas de débat, il n'y a pas eu véritablement de culture critique, probablement en partie parce que c'est des objets qui dysfonctionnent. Euh, L'expérience esthétique est généralement très décevante, ou, euh, sauf exception, elle est assez déceptive. So there was like no controversy or no debate about it, uh, because um, mm, there were uh, like uh, uh, works with a very uh, deceptive uh, uh, aesthetic most of the time. Et donc je pense qu'effectivement c'est tout un ensemble qu'il faut documenter, mais celui-là risque d'être le plus fra fragile, le plus manquant. C'est l'expérience qu'on pouvait avoir de ça. Il y a quelques souvenirs de Maus, etc. D'ailleurs, Maus a été reprogrammé euh, récemment parce que, justement, sur des objets comme ça, il y a une mémoire et on a envie de pouvoir partager cette mémoire. Et je pense que c'est ça l'enjeu de cette culture, c'est de dire est-ce qu'on a envie de partager, c'est-à-dire de, euh, de débattre, d'échanger, voire d'être en contradiction avec des expériences esthétiques qui ont été très peu euh, écrites Et en réalité, je, je pensais euh, ce matin qu'une des dimensions qui va permettre peut-être de faire vivre ces objets, c'est vraiment l'écriture. C'est bizarrement euh, une écriture critique élaborée, une expérience longue, ce qui est compliqué, euh, est un témoignage aussi intéressant, évidemment qui ne remplace pas, mais aussi intéressant que les machines et que les logiciels. 
dans le fond euh, de la tragédie grecque, on a des, des fragments de Platon et on n'a pas de, de restitution des scènes qui ont été produites. Et à travers ces éléments critiques, on, on imagine un peu ce que pouvait être la tragédie grecque. So that was too long, but uh, there, uh, there's no, uh, there's no, um, uh, there's the retranscription of uh, Platon's uh, 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 by no, no, Platon, but there's no like uh, nothing, the nothing about the dialogues of Socrates. So. Do you know what I mean? That, that this uh, critical uh, literature uh, will maybe be the, what is the most uh, interesting, uh, but what will also be the most uh, fragile at the end. That was. But so, I mean, I, 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 I'm completely in agreement. It's missing. Il, il faudrait en créer le, le discours critique sur le, le CD Rome, certainement. Uh, we, we should definitely create this. Uh, and I, I think it's the same in, on, in English. I mean, that it is, it is still a certain kind of a... I mean, that media history does have these kind of black holes, which we sort of like know existed. We have all these traces and things like that, but, but, we, but which really uh, uh, require this archaeology. So archaeology of the CD Rome is beginning, and it's, it's wonderful that even everybody is doing these things. On a, this is an important beginning uh, for that and your collection, everything. But we have to take it further, and we have to create the uh, sort of like a critical uh, discourse on that, and uh, and that could of course take many forms. I I, I wish it could uh, also take the form of such a traditional thing as book that would be really kind of. Uh, critical and uh, sort of like looking at these things from a sort of like a me media philosophical point of view, but also from the point of view of the reception studies, you know. So we, there is work to do. Well. I think it's one of the of the aims of the media art history reconferences since ten years. So uh, every two years, there's this big conference about media art history. And we have a lot to do yet about media art history. Yes, the, um, there's a media art history conference in Montreal in one week. Yes, are you going? Okay, she will be there, she can report. I will be missing. You know. Well, uh, I agree with you, Gilles, that uh, indeed there, there is a lack of critical discourse uh, about for instance, this cd rom production. Um, it's due to many reasons, uh, because indeed, uh, the, the cd rom we are interested in, that is mainly the art cd rom or art and culture, uh, well, there were not many people uh, looking at that uh, already in the 90s, uh, and there are still really very few people who can have access to that. Uh, so the first thing is probably to try to capture uh, uh, this uh, media, uh, the, the content and the knowledge and the uh, witness and uh, the literature around the existing things which were published at the time, and to have them accessible in research institution, in uh, uh, art organization, and maybe online, so that indeed archaeologists, historian, media uh, people, researcher can have a critical discourse about it, uh, and. Yes, that's true. I, I remember in the 90s the papers on CD-ROM, which were really critical and analytical in the writing, the electronic writing, the interactive writing, were really very rare. Nothing. Just a few, yours, uh, some from Annick Bureau, um, but really not too much. Um, and the production, there was a, a lot of things which are really bad. Uh, uh, so. Yes, but um, we have to capture them because uh, there are, for instance, here some people who have a lot of collection uh, and information, uh, but in 10 years it will be dead. So a very, very interesting early effort was, of course, the uh, uh, ZKM's Art Intact uh, series of book, book and CD, CD-ROM combinations, you know. So they always invited a number of uh, theorists or critics to write about the works before they were published. Uh, I, I did some writing for that series and many others, and, and plus there were interesting pieces there, some of them. But that, that tradition was discontinued, so it was just for a while, and uh, so then there is the sort of like 
Yeah, I agree. Euh, justement, je prends la question tout à l'heure, monsieur, qui l'a évoquée sur la culture cétérum. On a très peu sur la culture critique. Euh, je pense que c'est là le problème de la digital art, hein, les œuvres numériques interactives. Là, ça nous invite dans un autre espace numérique qui n'est plus comme avant, comme le support traditionnel. Par exemple, je prends l'exemple comme la critique littérature. Là, il y a une critique parce qu'il n'y a qu'une seule version écrite. Et puis, dans les CD-ROM ou dans les digitales, dans les œuvres numériques interactives, tout ça, finalement, euh, c'est un espace ouvert à la fois qui est invisible, mais qui est, tout est possible, il y a plusieurs possibilités. Et du coup, là, ça dépend le vécu de chacun. Et si on veut faire un enfin, retour à une critique, et là, il faut aller recueillir de toutes les expériences d'utilisateurs. Et, 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 et moi, je pense que c'est là, le, euh, comment dire, euh, une autre euh, forme, comment on peut apporter une critique. C est, c est, il, il faut <rire> réfléchir dessus. C'est ça que je dis que c'est difficile. C'est difficile. So, uh, um, the Uh, the critical uh, um, uh, look on, on uh, CD-ROMs or digital art is, is more difficult because you enter like uh, some kind of other uh, uh, space. Uh, um, unlike uh, for a, a literature critic, for instance, where you only have like one object and one version. Uh, uh, on the other end, in the digital art uh, realm, it's, it's more like a, an open space uh, uh, with very different kind of experience, and, and that is what, what makes it more uh, difficult, in your opinion. So maybe it's because it's considered to be this magical device, this magic going on. I mean, based on what uh, she was saying, that uh, it gets in the way of a critical position on it. Would you, I mean, would you think so? Or that uh, that the uh, that the fact that uh, the, these things are considered to be a sort of magic when they are first introduced, and only a few people like sort of latch onto it as something, and then it becomes sort of this other you go into this other world that it becomes hard to form a critical, I don't know, community around. Yes, uh, absolutely. Um, and this is exactly the sense in which I use the magical devices in the title of my new book. So it's uh, actually the word mag magical devices comes from Guy Debord from the Société du Spectacle, and it, in the sense that of, of this need of, in a way, breaking through them to those discourses behind those magical devices that, so that's exactly, so and I mean that, that these tend to be, well, I, I, you put it that very well, I mean that, and I think that we have certain kind of tasks, sort of like working behind that magic, you know, that's, that's, that's the product of the Société du Spectacle. That's something you see in media art a lot, actually, like all across the spectrum, that you don't actually get criticism until it's gone, in a way. <laughs> um, so, if there's no more questions, I think we will close uh, this session and close the day. Uh, thank you, all the speakers.